Okay, so I think we had some little bit of stuff left over from last class. We'll finish that and then do our final session on SQL. Uh, and you know that we'll have another class next week and the following week will be our test on SQL. Okay, and the SQL test will be exactly like the assignments you're doing. Um, you'll be giving the questions in advance. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's going to be very yes, similar. I'll give you the database files just like now. You know, technically you can just write the SQL without trying it out, but I'll give the database file. You can test it out, make sure you're comfortable, and then paste in your can answers. Can we do a test at home? Uh, test at home, uh, it's a possibility. I mean, I can leave it open for the week, and then you could, I, I don't mind. And then you could do it. Initiate it and finish it in a prescribed time. Right, exactly. So I'll probably I can set it up in such a way that you have a, a three hour slot. That'd be great. Right. So in, you choose any three hour slot you like, start and finish the test. Yeah, that that'll work. Okay. Do we need our laptops for it? like to get the? Of yeah. course, by Blackboard. Yeah, It'll be on Blackboard. We just set the homework then. No, exactly. The homeworks are all tests. Yeah. Okay. It'll be just like the homework. Okay. You know, say that again. <laughs> How many questions do you think they're going to do? Um, something like, oh, really? like 17, 17, 18, maybe 20 max. Okay. Yep. So I can set it up like that. Um, okay. Now, do you want to do that in lieu of class next week, or should we just shoot ahead and do the class next week? You mean? To the test because the, the week, yeah, the for week, week, week after, week. yeah. The Wait, week, what the week, week off the test. I would still do the class. Okay. Yeah, we'll do the test. For the test, rather than doing it. Well, I don't know. You'd rather sit here for three hours? I'd rather sit here and get it done than it's the same try and find three hours. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's not yeah. taking home, then. That's oh, yeah. taking class. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. We can, yeah. we can see what we can see what the class wants to do. Yeah, we can see what the class wants. No, my question was, if we do the take-home test, mm -hmm. do you still want to have Do you class? still want to have the class, or do you want to have... You know, that. I'm, I'm open either way too. So it just depends on how you I, I vote for take home test and a bike. And no class. Okay. But you can choose to take a test on your class. Yeah. Yeah. We can come here and. Oh, yeah, we, we, we have both. That, that's also true. Yeah. That's also true. Yeah, whenever the group wants to do that, we can do that. No, I'm saying we could have that option. You want to do it offline, you do it offline. If you want to do it in class, you can still do it in class. Yeah, that, that's okay. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll work all this out through email. So now we'll get started, continue with SQL. And this class, I've not been introducing too many new things, just a couple of new things. So it's sort of like a review. Uh, and I'm hoping that by doing the home assignments, you're starting to get a little more comfortable now. You know, like, uh, you know, the stuff in class might have gone on too fast and you know, sort of crazy with me showing stuff on the board and you trying to work your computer, that can get a little crazy. But I'm sure that with practice and trying the home assignments, that things are starting to settle down and you're seeing the, uh, you know, that it's not overly complex or anything. It's, it's basically straightforward stuff. You just need your own time to, to work it in. Okay, but at least I like to believe that. Okay. You keep saying that. Well, it'll come, it'll actually <laughs> it'll happen. Okay, so this was the last one we did. Uh, last time and we were looking at outer joins and within the outer joins we were trying to see you know answer queries like uh, you know supplier who's made okay this was just regular stuff okay. we said for suppliers who have not made any shipments just include only the supply name okay so this was just a regular join with supplier um, you know uh, from suppliers and shipments we can get the supplier name obviously by joining the supplier table to the shipments table on the supplier number, which is the key, right? But if you just did that regularly with a regular join instead of a left join, then you would get only details for suppliers who have made at least one shipment. In other words, because the shipments table obviously has only those supplier numbers which have made any shipments, okay? So when you join it, it's going to get appended to only those suppliers who have made at least one shipment, right? That's the normal way the join works. But we started looking at situations which said that for one of the tables, even if there's no join, please show me all the data. Okay, so that is when the concept of the outer join came into play for us. And then we said, okay, we can do a left join or a right join, and then we went into what do we mean by left and what do we mean by right. Okay, so when you're joining, you're 
you're mentioning at least two tables. You're mentioning one table first and the other table second. The one you mention first is on the left. Tip, you know, typically the way you write it, A followed by B. A is on the left, B is on the right, right? So if you want to give priority to A, you say A left join B. If you want to give priority to B, you say A right join B. By priority, I mean include details from that table even if there is no match. That's what we mean by priority. Okay, so that's the idea of the left and right join. We went through that, um, and the home assignments also would have done something with that. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So we've done all this. This is showing both the options, the left join option and the right join option. Okay, just stop me. I'm, you know, since we've been through this, I'm just you know sort of flowing through it as a way to introduce the class. But if there's any issue, just stop me, and I'll uh, I'm happy to go over the stuff again. Okay, so all this we've done left, right, etc. Okay, and this we did. Uh, in fact, this also we did in class. Okay, this is just. Exactly the same as we did for suppliers, except we are saying parts. So just for you to practice. Again, we did this in class, so there's no problem. Uh, list the names of suppliers who made no shipments. Okay, once again, it's an outer join. You have the uh, supplier, you know, left join shipments. Same thing. Okay, so in this case, this is slightly different. In the earlier case, it was... For suppliers who have not made any shipments, include the supplier information as well. Okay, that's what we were talking about. Now we are talking about something that's quite different. We are saying, just show me the names of suppliers who have not made any shipments. Okay, so we are basically going to use the same idea of doing the outer join. So when you do the outer join, this is what you get. Right, this is the, the super table from which the selection is going to occur. Right, so for all the suppliers who have made shipments, you have appended the appropriate supplier information by doing a regular join. Okay, but since we want also suppliers who made no shipments, we are doing a we will do a right join or left join depending on you know how we order the uh, name the tables. Okay, so we use an outer join, we get this. Okay, this is clear. This we have done several several times already. So now we are saying, show me the names of suppliers who have not made any shipments. Okay, so now from this big table, all we need to do is give me the supplier name for suppliers for whom the supplier number in the shipments table is not. Right, so those are the suppliers who have not made any shipments because their supplier numbers don't occur in the shipments table. Okay, so that's all we are doing here. This is just a very simple extension of what we had done earlier. Okay, this is the addition where Shipments dot supplier number is null. Okay, so when we did that, you will now get uh, only those two suppliers, Blake and Adams. Because for everybody else, the shipments dot supplier number is not null, so they'll get uh, eliminated. So you'll get only these. Okay, and I I was mentioning in the last class that before they invented outer joins, you had to sort of jump through a few hoops to get these kinds of queries. Uh, to work. You had to write sub-queries and those sub-queries were actually uh, very confusing many times. I mean, not, not difficult, but, you know, sort of uh, took some time to get used to it, but this makes it all much easier. Okay, so outer joins was a good, good addition there. Okay, so again, same thing I just said, do it with the left join instead of right join, that only changes the order of the table, there's nothing else. Okay, this was the last one we were doing last time. We said, uh, give the city name, city and the names of suppliers, parts, and projects uh, and quantity for all cases when the shipment has all the three from the same city. Right, and the trick here was to say the supplier city is same as part city and the part city is same as the project city. Right, because all the conditions, we are able to mention only two things and the question is apparently asking for three things to be matched. So initially we get confused, how am I going to say three things in the condition? Right, so we say A equals B and then B equals C. That's the same as saying A equals B equals C. That's all we did. You can't do three, you can't do A equals B equals C. No. Yeah, because the, the equals to, uh, equal to is a binary thing. It can only take two things. 
Okay, so that's what this was the only trick, and I think this is where we had stopped in the last class. Okay, so SQL is uh, till now we've looked only at one aspect of SQL, right? Which is the select. All our SQLs have started with select, right? Of course, that will work only if your database already has data in it, like our databases have had, because I gave you the file. So you didn't have to go through the process of creating the database, creating the table, and then putting data into the table. All that had been done for you ahead. So therefore, we were able to do all kinds of selects. Right? But actually speaking, if you look at SQL overall, it has two major components. One is called the DDL, or the data definition language. Okay. So data definition language consists of SQL syntax to create a database. Right? So, for example, our MySQL, the database engine, the database manager, in fact, when you start MySQL, it's a database manager. It manages many databases, and we've already created several databases within that database manager, like SBA is one database, college was another database, and so on, so, and SPJ, new, the supplier part, so that was a database. So, there are several databases residing inside this database server. Okay, so of course you need to have some way by which you can create a database, meaning tell MySQL, create a new database for me. I'm going to build a new application, so create a new database. You need language to do that. And once you've created the database, you can then say, inside this database, go ahead and create for me a table called student or a table called customer. Right? So you need a language to do that. And you interact with a relational database entirely through SQL. Okay, so outside of select and stuff, there is syntax to do all of this. Okay, and that is called the data definition language or DDL. So within which you create databases, tables, and indexes. Okay, now it's, it's good for you to know what an index is, although we never have to really deal with an index. Now think about typical tables in your, you know, in your own application. They have millions and millions of rows, right? And then, of course, when you when somebody logs in, let's say, to an Amazon account, you're saying, this is my username, this is my password. And, you know, Amazon probably has a billion users. And in a, in a you know, uh, short, in a very short span of time, in a microsecond or less, it has to go and verify that the correct person is logged in here. You know, that this username and this password are matched, right? To do that, it has to literally look through, you know, hundreds of millions of, uh, rows in a table, right? So obviously, if it did that sequentially, you know, we would never be able to log into these these systems at all, right? So that is why you have this notion of an index that databases use in order to efficiently access data. It's exactly the concept of an index at the end of a book, right? You want to, you know, you're reading a book, you want to look for a particular concept, you turn over to the end of the book, you look and see which page that particular concept occurs in, it tells you this concept occurs in pages, you know, 200 and 566. You only go to those two pages. Okay, that's exactly what an index is in a database system, right? So you, uh, database administrators will typically create indexes based on the, you know, their uh, understanding of how the data is actually being used, right? If this is being used very often, then they create an index for it. Okay, and SQL also has syntax to create indexes. So an index is not just accessing by the primary key, which is the supplier number or whatever. You may have to access a supplier by their city. You may have to access suppliers by the supplier name, etc. So you can have uh, primary key indexes, which is always there. Primary key always creates an index. But you can also create other indexes. Okay. So there's a SQL syntax to do indexes. And other things, you know, there are table spaces and all kinds of things in different databases. So, uh, DDL covers all of those. DML is the part of SQL that deals with data manipulation. Okay, so you define your data structures here, and then you manipulate the data with using the DML parts of SQL. And of course, in manipulate data, you uh, learn, uh, you use the commands to insert data into tables. We'll, we'll look at the syntax for some of these things. Okay, so for example, you say, okay, uh, add a new customer whose customer uh, ID is one, whose customer name is, you know, Joseph, 
etc etc you specify all this and then it will go and put that data into the table so that is inserting data and of course select which is 90 95% of sql which is what we've been looking at all the time and then update right you may say this customer's address change it from 100 main street to you know 200 broad street right so you want to update information that exists inside the database then you use an update statement and then of course delete it okay, which is get rid of this row okay, i think modern practice is not delete anything everything is there and then you just archive it somewhere or whatever okay. so this is just you know broadly speaking everything that sql covers although we've been looking at only a very small small part of it okay so now we'll just look at some syntax for some of these other things now as you can understand those things are much much easier than select but select is the complicated thing in in very uh, complex ways you're trying to retrieve information these are more straightforward okay you want to create a new database just say create database and say what is the name of the database okay so create database zoom will create a database name zoom in fact you can type this into your you know Heidi SQL and then you say run after that process you'll see a new database okay or if you look at the scripts that I'm giving you you'll see these statements there as well okay <clears throat> and within the database I'm creating now you know, some tables okay of course you'll have to first say use okay. is it there okay so the dollar so in order to you're going to create a table but you have to tell the Heidi SQL system you want this table to be in which database because you may have many databases you want to tell uh, not Heidi SQL really you're telling your MySQL look I'm going to create a table but all the operations I'm performing will now be on this table right? so after this you may want to put a table into some other database then you'll say use that and then Okay. Now, of course, within Heidi SQL, all this is happening automatically because when you just simply click on the name of the database on the side, and if you look at the status bottom, below, you'll see it says use, right? If you just click on something, you'll see at the bottom, you'll get an echo that says use this. It's generating those SQLs. Okay. That's all is happening. So that's really what Heidi is doing for us. It's converting our GUI actions into SQL, which it then sends over to MySQL, and then the things happen. That's what's going on. Okay, so we are first creating a table called animal types, which is going to represent types of animals about which we are going to store data in a database, right? So for example, I may have 10 lions, you know, in a zoo and 20 whatever, right? So broadly speaking, the zoo has lions and, you know, zebras, etc., etc. So those are our animal types, okay? The, the types of animals about which we are going to store information. And then we'll have another table called animals, which will have actual information about animals. Okay, just, just to take a simple example. Okay, so this table animal types is going to have uh, two fields. Okay, the first field is going to be called animal type <coughs> ID. Okay, that's going to be the primary key. Okay, uh, which is common for any table that we create. We need to have a primary key because we usually cannot depend on uh, you know, for example, for people, we cannot depend on their names being a unique identifier to them because lots of people have the same name. So you have a social security number as the primary key for people. Similarly, I'm just saying animal type ID is the primary key for animals. And I'm saying that this will have values, integer values, int, and five digits, max. Okay, so it could be, you know, could, you could have one, two, three, four, five, etc. But maximum it can have is five digits, is what we are saying. And we are saying this is not null, right? Because it's going to be a primary key and it's not allowed to be blank. Whenever you put a row into this table, you have to have a value for animal type ID. You cannot leave it blank. That's what we are saying. Because it's the primary key. Because it's the primary key. And sometimes even for other things, you may say not null. For example, here itself. Right? Because and you're saying this is animal type ID is 10. And there's no point if you don't have the animal name. Right. just going to have the key so it's some sometimes you'll say many fields are required fields not null if you don't say not null then null value would be accepted but those are inter integer friends five and not all those two separate commands yes they're all separate things right up to this comma 
is all a specification of this first field up to the first comma. Right? So we are saying this is the name of the field, this is the type it is, it's an integer, and this is the length. It's not allowed to be null. And also we are saying this field is an auto increment field. Okay, which means that suppose I go and it'll make it one, two, three, four, five. So automatically. Right? So when I add a new value, I don't have to specify the animal type ID. The system is going to keep track of it. First you insert a row, it'll make it one. Next two. So of course you could there are ways to specify the starting number as well. You could say it's auto increment and the starting value is one thousand. Okay. And then the first time is one thousand, next is one thousand and one, etc. Right? Otherwise it becomes really painful. Before we insert it, we have to go and find out whether what we are inserting already exists or not. Right? That becomes a pain. Right? When you create a new customer, for example, you don't worry about what number gets assigned to them so long as a unique number gets assigned, that's it. Okay, or an invoice number, things like that. Okay, so that's what auto increment is. Now primary keys do not have to always be auto increment, but it's just convenient. Okay, so the next field here is animal type name, like you know, it's the values would be lion and tiger, etc. And this is a var care 50. That is, it's a character field. This was an integer field. This is a character field with a maximum length of 50. Right? I could have said char 50. Right? You can say char 50, but problem with char 50 is it will always occupy 50 characters. <coughs> okay? Most of the names are not 50 characters. Most of the names are 5 characters, 10 characters, 20 characters. So var care allows the system to occupy only as much space as is required. It's just a space saving mechanism, that's all. Okay, so it's a variable character length. Of course, maximum is 50. That's what we're seeing here. So max is 50, not 50 or more. No, it's max is 50. This is the, yeah, max length. Same, same thing as 5 here, that's the maximum. Okay, so this is, max is 50. And then again, we are also saying that this is not null. Not allowed to be null. If you didn't say that, then it would allow you to create a row in the table and leave that completely unspecified. Okay, but we are saying, no, don't do that. And here we have now, till now, we have not said that this is the primary key. Right, although that's our intent, we have not explicitly told the system it's a primary key. Here we are telling the system, the primary key for this table is animal type ID. So is in, the, in the print there, is that, is that order then specific to how the order will be in the, in the database, in the table rather? This, this order? Yeah. First, first this, uh, yeah. yeah that, so that's how, that's the order in which you see. So it doesn't assume the first field is a primary key? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, you could have made, you know, your primary key field could have been defined as the tenth field. Doesn't matter. Okay. And of course, in general, the order of the fields is insignificant. The row, order of the rows is insignificant. There's no guarantee, but yeah. But typically, you create it like this and you go and look at it, you'll see it in that order. In my head, it's important. Yeah. It, that, <laughs> that's the order in which you'll see it too. <laughs> Is there supposed to be an open quote in front of the uh, the very first animal type? Here? Yeah. Why? Well, I don't see where that gets. There's a close. Yeah, oh, it's an open it's parent. Yeah. There are two okay. here. There are okay. two at the end, right? Yeah. So that has to be that way with the. Uh, yes. With the, yeah. the of course, you know, you could Prince. you could break it up into multiple lines and space, you know, in any way you like. You know, it doesn't have to be that this has to occur in the next line or something. I could have put this whole thing as one line to still work. But it has to be in the parentheses. Yes, yes. The parentheses are mandatory. When you say create, again, can be uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter. Create, table, you know, that is, those are uh, important. This is, of course, any name we choose for our table. So create table X, and then you start the parentheses, and then you define the various columns you need in your table. Okay. Now, most relational database systems would make it mandatory for you to have a primary key for your table. Okay. Again, you know, relational database is a concept. And then you have many vendors who provide their relational databases. You know, MySQL is one, Oracle is another, and then you've got uh, Sybase is one, and then, uh, you know, so many different things. And then you've got Microsoft SQL Server. All of these are different implementations of the relational model. And of course, you know, for competitive advantage, each will put in some of its own small features. Okay. So, uh, so, for example, Microsoft Access is also a relational database. So it's a desktop relational database. So, Access will allow you to create a table with no primary key. Okay, whereas Oracle would not, and MySQL will not. Okay, so those are just some. But the SQL we are learning here is, for the most part, what is called the ANSI SQL. 
It's a standard. There is a, you know, American National Standards Institute has some standards. And what we are learning here is, uh, for the most part, ANSI SQL. So this is all ANSI SQL. So you can type this into any uh, SQL database. It will still work exactly like this. Okay. So here we are specifying the primary key. So now we are looking at, okay, we have created the database. We created the table. We created a table. And now we are inserting data into the table. Okay. So insert into, that's the syntax. And then you indicate the table into, what you, into which you want to insert data. And then you specify the, uh, the field names, you know, open parentheses. And here uh, we want to insert only value for animal type name. And because animal type ID is auto increment, you won't worry about it. And then we give the values we want to insert. So if you had multiple uh, attributes, if you had, in this case we don't, you'd say animal type name, comma, x, y, z, and then you would say values, lion, comma, whatever value it is. Okay? So you, because you will be inserting values for many columns, not just one column, uh, as in this example. Can you do multiple at the same time? Uh, meaning? Meaning I have several like lion, tiger, bear. You can, you okay. can. Yeah. So you can. Yeah. Oh, my. oh my, yeah, sorry. I couldn't help myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. Uh, in fact, if you look at the example SQL files I've given you, you'll see the syntax to do that. Okay. So we're not specifying the animal type ID because it's an auto increment field. So in this case, automatically, if you looked at the, you know, if you did this and looked at it, you will find one for lion. Uh, Okay, lion would have become one automatically. Okay, and then of course, tiger and giraffe and hippopotamus, etc., etc. Just more and more of the same. Okay, so after that, your table would look like this. If you can select star from animal types. Now we are creating another table for the actual animals. Okay, in fact, what we are doing here is creating a new database, very simple database, okay, and, you know, we're creating the tables and putting values into it, okay. So now you see here, uh, create database animals, not animal types. So now in the lion, uh, you know, you, you're going to have many lions and many tigers and many giraffes and so on. And each lion and tiger and giraffe and so on will have its own ID and name, etc., etc. Okay. So animal ID is the key of the animal table int 5, not null, auto increment, like before. And now here is a field that says what, what is the animal type ID corresponding to a particular animal, right? So you want to say, I'm going to create animal number 1. Animal number 1 is going to be a lion, for example. So you will indicate that it's a lion by putting the uh, ID of lion. Okay, we'll see an example of that. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see that, okay? Uh, so, and then animal name, weight, you know, some, some fields, okay? And primary key is animal type, animal ID, as before. This is what is important. Here we are saying that the animal type ID is going to be from the primary key of the animal type table. Okay. In fact, maybe I should just, uh, let's take a look at this. Insert into animals, okay? Animal type ID, animal name, animal weight. Okay, we are not giving animal ID because that's auto increment. Okay, now remember, if you remember one in the animal type, it stood for lion. So we're creating a new lion. Okay. Lioness, if you like. Uh, insert into animals these fields. The values are one to say that it's a lion. The name is Lisa. The weight is 200. I don't know what 200 watt for 200. But do we have to do this before we get into specifics here? Yes, right? Because the, the see, unless you did this, the table will not exist. Table. Right? So here we are creating the table. So what we did was we created the database, then created a table, the animal types table into the, in the database, then inserted some values for animal types. So now we have several animal types. Now we create the animals table and we are inserting values into the animals table. Okay? Yeah. Can you go back to the 
constraint. Constraint, yes. Okay. So what we're saying here is it's it's subjected to the fields in the other table, basically. Right. So so now you get what the animal type ID is doing, right? Because we put in, uh, yeah, this is important. So we put in one here to indicate that this is a line, right? So, and that is animal type ID, okay? So if we go back to this one, so we are saying now this animal type ID is an integer, right? Now, nothing stops me, because it says it's an integer, nothing stops me from putting 1,000 there, okay? But then there is no animal type with the value 1,000. Right? Because the only animal types that exist are 1, 2, 3, and 4 as of now. Right? So therefore, when I am creating a new animal, at this stage, I should not really put any value other than 1, 2, 3, or 4 into the animal type ID. Right? Now, if I do not specify this constraint, the system doesn't know the connection between this field and that field. It will allow you to put any arbitrary stuff into that field. You may go and put 1,000. It takes it. Right? So you're kind of creating the match ahead of time. You're creating the match. Right? But what's the FK1 foreign key? Okay, it's a foreign key. It's just a name. Right? When you create a foreign, this is a foreign key, right? Here you're saying that this is not just any arbitrary integer field, but this refers to the animal type ID field in the animal type state. Right? Therefore, do not allow any values which don't exist there to be put here. Okay? So this is it's, it's maintaining the integrity of the database. It's enforcing that integrity. That's why it's called as a constraint. Okay. So the way you define a constraint is say constraint, and then you give a name to the constraint. Okay. We are just, you know, foreign key, foreign key one, animal types. This is just a name. And then we are saying foreign key is animal type ID. So animal type ID is a foreign key. And when you say something is a foreign key, you're saying it is the primary key of some other table, right? So primary key of which table? So this references the primary key of the field animal type ID from the animal type table. Almost like a join. This is facilitating later on when you do a join, this is facilitating that, exactly. Okay. So this is just saying the values for this field have to come from the values of this field in this table. Otherwise, don't allow it. Because otherwise, your database will pretty soon lose its integrity. All kinds of junk will be there, and then you will not be able to make any sense of so it. So every table you build has to have that. If it has a foreign key. For example, our animal types table had no foreign key, so it would need that. Right? So you will have some few tables that are just, you know, Atomic in the sense that they don't have any foreign keys, but many tables will have foreign keys. Most tables will have foreign keys. I mean, is it fair to say that those the tables that don't have foreign keys are kind of like the master table, and then the rest of thing kind of feeds off of those master Exactly. Tables? Yep. Yep. Definitely. Okay. So this constraint is called as a foreign key constraint. Okay. So when you know database theorists like to talk about integrity constraints in the database. In other words. These constraints are automatically enforced by the system once you define them. Now, you may say, well, why would somebody go and enter a value of 10 for an animal type when it doesn't exist? Shouldn't they know? Right? But then that relies on somebody to make the right decision. Right? Or, you know, some type typing error happens and the wrong data gets into the database. What this does is this says, even if you make a mistake, I'm not going to allow you to make that mistake. It will reject it. Right, the system will come back and tell you, uh, you know, foreign key constraint, FK1 animal types has been violated. It's not, it's not one or two or three or four. Yeah, it's not a one or two or three or four, right. So it will tell you the name of the foreign key, so then you will know what happened. And then you can go and, and fix the problem. Similarly, the uh, primary key is also considered as an integrity constraint. That is called entity integrity. Right, that is you are making sure that no two rows of a table end up with the same value for that particular field. Okay, that every field has a unique, uh, every row has a unique reference to it in any table. That's called entity integrity. Okay, this is called referential integrity. That you don't refer to something that, that doesn't exist. Okay, so these are all, once you create them, 
automatically enforced by the database system. You don't need to worry about it. <coughs> okay, so this is our just some some values. I guess now we could have CC added to this. <laughs> So this is what our uh, animal type table is going to look like. Okay. So this is these two are lions and whatever else these are. Okay. Select star from animals, and this is. So now we can do a join, just like he was pointing out. So now we can say, for every animal, don't give me the animal type, but give me the animal's name, animal type name. Right. So we can say select. Animal ID, animal type name, <coughs> animal name, animal weight from animals in a join, animal types, etc. Et Just a regular join like we did before. Okay. So instead of saying you know one one three four, we are now able to say lion lion. Okay. <coughs> now the question we may ask is well, why did we decide to in this context to have two tables, animal types and animals? That's the database design. So, so for all the databases we are using now, supplier parts database or college database or the SBA database, right? Those databases had certain tables and certain connections between the tables, right? How do we know in a given situation? I want to build a new application for, you know, materials management. Let's say, you know, for inventory management. How do I know what tables I should create and how those tables should be connected? Okay. That is the stuff of database design, which is what we look at next. Okay, so what you'll be able to do then is you'll be able to sit down and say, okay, this is my business. These are the business rules, and therefore these are the tables I need to create. And then you can you know, go ahead, uh, create the actual tables inside the database, and then you can start building applications that actually use those uh, that data. Okay, so we'll be looking at all of this as we go forward. Okay, so that was really where I had planned to end the last class. Yeah. <laughs>